Please take your Bibles, and I'm turning to Hebrews chapter 10, and I read the first 10 verses. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. I would want to also take you back to Leviticus chapter 16, which was read a few moments ago, and to highlight the atonement that took place each year on the Day of Atonement through many centuries of the Old Covenant. We are dealing with the will of God. And at the outset of Leviticus chapter 16, there is reference to an event which is passed over very quickly, but it's vitally important that we be reminded of the death of the two sons of Aaron who did not approach God as was pleasing to the Lord and so suffered the consequences in death of their foolishness. We must underscore for our help, we must be clear that there are two ways that we can approach God there is the right way and there is the wrong way. There is the right and there is the wrong. Second of all, we must be clear exactly how it is that we are to approach God. Is that right way coming out of our imagination or out of our own creative, creative religious ideas? Does it come from public opinion? Does it come by consensus, our best collective guess? No, not at all. We must be clear that the approach to God has been given by God himself, and we must attend to that. The religions of our world, they have all kinds of ideas about how there might be a proper approach to God and they get it wrong. Here we have God speaking. He is giving to Moses the specific instructions, and as we have it here on the, for the Day of Atonement of Leviticus chapter 16, it goes to considerable detail as to how that the high priest himself was to be prepared, but also how that he was to make sacrifice and offering for the sins of the people. A right way and a wrong way. Right and wrong, there is no middle ground. We also need to be clear on the provision that has been made for us. The Day of Atonement prefigures 
in a very wonderful way of how that our great high priest, Jesus Christ, would come and how that He would make sacrifice for us. But through the Old Testament, we have the high priest on that day coming to make sacrifice, first of all, for himself, having been properly dressed, having been properly prepared. Vital that he makes that sacrifice for himself. And he goes in with blood, the blood of a bull, And there are also those two other animals, those two goats that accompany. And I am especially intrigued by them. The one which suffers death and the other which is set at liberty, though out in the wilderness. But first of all, the high priest, he comes with both a sin offering, because he was a sinner, and there needed to be a cleansing on his behalf, there also was a ram, and it is said it was for a burnt offering. A sin offering, we understand. A burnt offering, however, is a little bit different. A burnt offering was to be, like the sin offering, a substitute in place of the worshiper, the offender, the sin offering, it was because that animal was taking the penalty of the worshiper. And the burnt offering was also a substitute for the worshiper. The sin offering was for the violations, it was for the wickedness, it was for the rebellion of the person the burnt offering, it was pointing that here was something that was to be wholly consumed. As we are to be wholly taken up with the things of God and with the things that occupy His priorities and which weigh upon His thoughts and intents. So the sin offering, the burnt offering, they are brought near. Aaron, he goes into the inner part of the tabernacle, and that is made every year. And then there is that goat, which is chosen by Lot, and it is taken, and it is killed. But the other goat, Aaron comes to, and he lays his hands upon the head of that animal, and he confesses all of the sins of the people, over that goat, and that one is taken away. You remember that repeatedly in the Scriptures, there are the lambs, or or there is the sheep, and there is the goats. The one we are sort of attracted to, those nice, woolly, fluffy sheep. And the goats, they're off on the other side, and even Jesus, at the end of Matthew, He speaks of how that on judgment day there will be a division of the sheep and the goats. The sheep going to blessing and life everlasting and the goats going off to perdition and to judgment and for damnation everlasting. And so here we have the goats, the one that is sacrificed and the one that is led away they are also a reminder of Jesus Christ who is sacrificed for us. But even in the terminology which is used, the goat, Jesus Christ is the one who was shunned, who was scorned, who was thought less of. And He is our scapegoat who takes our sin away. And so we have the Day of Atonement again and again and again. Those who first of all received the book of Hebrews, they would automatically have this in their thoughts. They were Jews who through many years had heard of this taking place. Perhaps they had even been in Jerusalem on some occasions and as much as they could see 
not much, but what they could see, they were observing the high priest in his preparations and them bringing the bull and the ram and the two goats and then that one goat to be led away into the wilderness. All of this is something that was commonly understood. In Hebrews chapter 10, we might come and say, this is starting to sound a little bit repetitious. We have heard that there is a dichotomy taking place between the law of the Old Testament and the covenant that God gave to the people and the covenant of God's grace and of His mercy in Jesus Christ. The difference between the many priests and high priests of the Old Testament and the one great high priest that we have in Jesus Christ and much else. But these things are pushed upon us and they are repeated to us because of their vital importance and of the earth-shaking work that God did in bringing Jesus Christ that He might in fact be our great high priest. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1, the shadow or the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form or the very solid substance of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, and we'll come to chapter, uh, verse 10, which in contrast points out once, once, not every year, once, those sacrifices which they continually offer year by year, they can't make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder, a reminder of sins year by year. It's like Paul standing up throughout all of the Old Testament and saying, I'm going to write about this in Romans chapter 3, that all have sinned. You're all sinners. We've all gone astray. We've all missed the mark. There is none righteous. No, not one. In those sacrifices, even as they are seeking to draw near to God and to be acceptable to Him, it is the reminder we have blood on our hands. We are guilty. We are vile. And the very reason we go through this is because of the sin that stains us to the very core. Verse 4 for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when He, Jesus, comes into the world, He says, addressing His heavenly Father, sacrifice and offering you have not desired. Mark that word. Sacrifice and offering you have not desired. And let me skip into verse 6, in whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. So God has not desired all of this sacrifice, all of these whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, not a desire for them nor pleasure for them, but in verse 5, Jesus says, but a body you have prepared for me. Throughout the New Testament, in every book, if we look for it, there is a mention of Bethlehem and the Incarnation. You might not have the Magi or the shepherds, but you have the coming of Jesus from the glories of heaven into this world that He might be our Savior that He might bear upon Himself our load, that He might meet the demands that are placed upon 
this world demands of holiness a body. Here Hebrews is taking us back to Bethlehem and that wonder of wonders that the second person of the Trinity came and descended into this world to be within the womb of a virgin and there to grow and there to be born to live and die for us. So, verse 7, Then I said, Behold, I have come, in the scroll of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Now verse 8, once again, just within this portion, you wonder, it's going to say the exact same thing as we just had it. But because of the earth-shaking character of what God did, it bears repetition, if anything does. After saying above sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you have not desired nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. He takes away the bulls and the rams and the goats. He takes away this whole host of high priests and priests in the Old Testament and He brings us to the One. The One who had come in order to truly please the Father. The Father was not desiring nor pleased with all of these different things, but how He would find His great delight in His Son coming to do His bidding in order that He might redeem a people for His great name. He takes away the first in order to firmly establish that second, that, that one who would come whose great desire was simply to honor His heavenly Father and to do what He had asked of Him. Now verse 10, by this will, Jesus had said to His Father, I have come to do Your will. Not in a general sort of ethereal, well, I'll help out here and I'll sort of do whatever. Jesus was coming to do the Father's will very specifically. Very specifically. Not just to randomly heal a few people and to speak words of wisdom, but to die upon Calvary. I have come. And a body you have prepared. Why a body? Because that body will be taken and it will be nailed to the cross. There needed to be flesh and blood in order that a sacrifice would be made 33 years later after Bethlehem. A body was vital and Jesus said, I've come and your will includes suffering. It includes pain. It includes mocking and humiliation and 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 all kinds of scoffing and belittling. It includes the weight of the world's sin upon the sinless soul of Jesus Christ. But Jesus, He came and He said, I have come to do Your will, O My Father. Now verse 10, by this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. The will of the Father was that Jesus come to be the atoning sacrifice for you and for me. Jesus, He submitted to that will. And as a result, we have cleansing and we have the mighty power of God that comes upon us that we might begin to really live for the first time. Having said all of that, there is a key problem in Verse 10, and it is with that one word, sanctified. 
We have been sanctified. Usually when students of the Bible come to study the scriptures, the word sanctification is reserved for a long-term, lifelong work that God does in a person by bringing them more and more to holiness and that we partner with God. Let me remind you of four different good words of the Bible. Justification, regeneration, adoption, and that word sanctification. Justification, regeneration, adoption, and sanctification. The first three happen, I would say, simultaneously and instantaneously. We are brought to life when God comes and He stands as He did at Lazarus' tomb and He says, come forth. And we come forth out of death into life. That is regeneration where we have been absolutely dead in our trespasses and sins and we come forth to life. But we come forth and we stand guilty and we need to be justified. We cannot do that based upon our own dollars, upon our own merit, upon our own works. We need someone else to justify us. God comes and He speaks that Jesus Christ is the one who justifies us. The gavel comes down and that righteousness which was Christ's is imputed to us. We have been regenerated. We have been brought to life. We have been justified. We have been made righteous. We have been made just as if we had never sinned. We are clean and we are adopted into the family of God. But sanctification is generally a work whereby we are brought more and more in line with the thinking of God, with the desires of God, where less and less of the world attracts us, whereas before it had such a pull upon us as God continues His work and as He invites us to work along with Him in this. We grow in holiness and take a greater delight in the things of God. Here in verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 10, we are said that by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. What is taking place is that all of God's work all of God's work in regeneration, justification, adoption, and sanctification, it's all being tied together and in that one word, all of God's great work is being exalted. Should anyone ever say, well, I am growing to know the Lord better and better and they become in any way arrogant, in any way boastful, that they are excelling, that they are moving forward, we remind them, how did it all start? Nothing that we accomplish, though we are invited to share in the work, absolutely nothing would be accomplished except that Christ was the one who brought us alive imputed to our vile hearts His righteousness and adopted us into the family of God. By this will, we have been sanctified. In creation, Adam and Eve were created in order to bear the image of their heavenly Father who had created them. When we are brought to life in Christ, we are to bear the image of our great Creator and our Redeemer, our Savior and our Lord. 
and we are to have His imprint placed upon us. Even as Jesus came and He said to His Father, I have come, and though the road is long and difficult, though there be pain, I come and I submit myself to Your will. That is God's desire for each and every one of us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, we read the Apostle Paul saying, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you might grow in God's holiness and grow to know Him and to be like Him. Lord, we give you thanks and praise that you are continuing to do your will to accomplish your plan. And may each of us submit to that plan. And may we exalt you in all that we do. Hear us, Lord. Work your will. Draw us. Make us more like our great Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be the praise now and forever we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.